Well, it's great to be back with you this morning. I'm delighted that so many of you came back. It's always a great risk when you're having a, a foretaste and you're not quite sure whether it tastes that good. But um, I'm especially grateful, let me say again, how thrilled I am to be uh, helping Brian and his team in this uh, wonderful adventure um, and reflecting on what to me is a very important topic, uh, and that is the reintegration of the church and the arts and the importance of a redeemed imagination. It's something that's become very dear to my heart, but in truth, it's not always been something that I've thought about. As I mentioned last night, I grew up in a little Baptist church, and it's safe to say that the worship life was predictable. Uh, every Sunday we gathered uh, with the same basic number of folks, the pastor preached, the deacons prayed, uh, the choir sang familiar hymns, and that was it. And then once a quarter, we had the Lord's Supper, and whether we needed it or not. And, um, <laughs> and that was, we had uh, these wonderful little uh, plastic glasses, remember those little things, and grape juice. And I, as a young boy, loved to go in the back room and help them fill. When I was about Jack's age, I would go back and help them fill the little glasses with grape juice and then empty the ones that were not used afterwards. <laughs> so that was my great joy, not exactly inspirational. But then when I was about 11 years old, uh, I was a, a boy, boys' brigade member. It's kind of like uh, Cub Scouts. And we had our parade at the local Anglican church, the Church of England church, on the other side of town. And we went there, and I was absolutely blown away. I'd never actually seen that sort of high-end liturgical practice in my whole life. And, you know, there was smells and there was bells and there was people walking around looking very mysterious and I thought I'd left town and gone got a glimpse of heaven I thought this is amazing I've never seen anything like it in my life it just was just blew all my fuses but went back to normal life at the Baptist church and then as I mentioned last night went to visit the Anglican church where my wife-to-be Angela was a member now they were not quite as high on the liturgical spectrum but nevertheless, it was still a very much different experience from the Baptist church of which I've been part. Again, you understand, I'm not putting one down or other, just different, just very different. And then as I quickly realized how much I loved Angela, her father put his foot down and made it clear that I had to join the church. Um, he was the bell master, his uncle, her uncle was the choir master. You got the idea. This was a church, a family operation, and I had to become part of it. And so... Some of you know the Baptist church tradition is not get baptized until you're of age, and so I'd not actually been baptized, even though I was 15 years old. And so I was instructed in what it meant to become a Christian uh, in baptism and confirmation class by a delightful uh, man. I've never forgotten his name. His name was the Reverend Mr. Thornber. Sounds kind of like a Dickens character. Um, but he was a very serious student of the Bible, and, uh, and so he reminded me that Anglican worship at its heart, is fundamentally based in Scripture. And so he um, opened some Scripture for me, and I want to read to you a little portion from Isaiah chapter 6. It um, begins this way. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each has six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. And then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongues from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, Here am I, send me. Now some of you will recognize that ancient song of the seraphim is now being enshrined within the Anglican service of Holy Communion. There's a first part, and also the Catholic service, first part of the 
a song of the people called the Sanctus. Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Now, that little passage, you've got to admit, that stretches imagination. I mean, that is mind-blowing to actually imagine that experience that you went through. And and in a very real sense, that encounter has shaped liturgical worship from from the get-go. Because this dramatic form of his of this encounter is also reflected in the shape of many of our liturgical forms. It starts with a personal crisis. We all enter into the Lord broken. And there was a crisis at the time, a time of national scandal. Isaiah was 16 years old when he was made king of Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, where he served faithfully for almost 50 years. But towards the end, he became increasingly arrogant. Although the cost of leadership... His pride got the better of him, and he began to worship himself, a rather contemporary problem. As a result, he was afflicted with leprosy and eventually died a lonely and bitter death. It was then that Isaiah was given his amazing vision. So this encounter, as indeed I believe all true worship does, begins with brokenness, profound brokenness. Woe is me. But then something happens. He saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Now that is a vision, and artists have struggled to capture it ever since. And not only that, but he sees the seraphim. Now each of these angelic creatures had six wings. With two he covered covered his face, two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. He flew. And this is the only time the seraphs are mentioned in the Bible, although they do seem to correspond to the living creatures described by John in his own heavenly encounter. They also have six wings, and they sang the same song of praise. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, this triple repetition is the Hebrew way of underlining, saying, yes, this is absolutely important. It is underlining the infinite holiness of God. And then we read that the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. This is more than a dramatic effort. effect. It is indeed a graphic reminder of the time when God spoke at Mount Sinai, and the entire mountain shook and was covered with smoke. See, the people of Israel were terrified. So was Isaiah, and so would you be. But Isaiah's response is far more than simple fear, because listen again to his words. Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. See, when Isaiah is confronted with the infinite holiness of God, he is brought face to face with his own unworthiness and uncleanness. Now, friends, let's face it, personal holiness is not a very popular subject then or today. Yet holiness is very much a biblical objective. The word holy in various forms occurs more than 600 times in the Bible. One entire book, Leviticus, which I know you've not made it through without struggle, is devoted to the subject. And this idea of holiness is woven through the fabric of Scripture. More important, it is something that God has specifically commanded. To be holy means to be totally consecrated to God and therefore totally separated from sin. And that's why we must all begin with Isaiah on our knees saying, Woe is me, O Lord, have mercy. When we confront the awesome holiness of God, we are driven to our knees. And notice the first area where Isaiah feels convicted is in the use of his mouth. The words that we speak are far more important than any of us are willing to believe. And I've struggled with this because I grew up at a time when sarcasm was an indoor sport, (laughs) at which I was very good. But sarcasm is a way of destroying people with humor and with sly cuts. And I've had to repent of that. Because it's easy to use your mouth to kill. I'm grateful to Tony for his book on imagination. And that the way in which he points out that when we pull down children, when we tear them down, 
we destroy their own sense of who they are. It's a very cruel thing to do. Our words are powerful. Be careful with your words, my friends. I agree today because of the, the sloppiness with the way in which words are used in, in, in popular culture. We can speak words of life or we can speak words of death. Words that build up or words that tear down. And we've all failed to consistently use our mouths to God's glory. Just as the people of Isaiah's time were a people of unclean lips, we also live in such a society and we need help. But help is available. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And in this dramatic picture, Isaiah is brought face to face with the fact that he cannot take care of his own sin, nor can we. If we are to be made right with God, and all of us, everyone knows we're not right with God, then we have to be willing to accept God's action on our behalf. The coal that was taken from the altar was frankly a preview of what Jesus would do for each one of us on the cross at Calvary. In the shedding of his blood, there is forgiveness for our sins. And this forgiveness is the first step in purifying our hearts, cleaning up our lips, and preparing us for lives of service. Atonement, that's what we call it. It's a good old-fashioned word that means to bring together those who are separated. I like to break it apart, at one meant. Kind of brings it all together, atonement. It is a universal need because sin is a universal problem. Not a popular word to use, but it's an essential word if we understand the human condition. Whatever became of sin is a title, a little book written by Dr. Carl Menninger in 1973, before many of you were born. The author is more famous for the Menninger Clinic in Topeka, Kansas, but his book continues to be a testimony to his care for the whole person. In it, he points out that for all of our scientific developments, especially our insights about the human mind, we have not removed the reality of sin. If anything, we have increased it because we now can barely see through the verbal smoke screens that we have created. But sin is a reality, and it is deadly serious. Time and time again, the scriptures warn about its seriousness. Remember those familiar words. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. See, the implication is clear. Unless something is done about our sin, we are condemned to perish. See, for Jesus, the consequences of unforgiven sin were too terrible to even think about. And because of his great love for us, he keeps warning us about it. See, our God is a holy God and cannot stand sin. And on our own, we would all be in desperate trouble. But thanks be to God, we're not on our own. God has done something about the problem of our sin. And in this beautiful picture from the prophet Isaiah, we see that we, what we have to do is to honestly acknowledge our need and then accept God's gift. But that isn't the end of the story. Listen to the last verse of our text. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And then I said, Here am I. Send me. See, in grateful response for all that he's experienced, Isaiah presents himself for service. He's ready to go wherever he is called. And in the verses that follow, Isaiah is warned that his ministry will not always be well received. It does not, however, change his commitment to serve wherever he is directed. Our service may be ministering to the powerful or the powerless. It may be in words of wisdom or acts of simple service. Our motivation must always be the same. It is in, the sa it is in response to the love and forgiveness that God has freely given to each one of us. So, in those eight verses from Isaiah, 
we have the foundational principles for biblical worship that will stretch your imagination and indeed transform your lives. Number one, we encounter the presence of God in all of his holiness. Two, we are confronted with our own unworthiness. Three, we accept God's forgiveness. And four, in grateful response, all we can do is offer our lives. Now that, I submit to you, is an outline of true worship and is always incomplete without the fourth step, a personal response to the call to serve. Almost um, 30 years ago, Angela and I were living in Lafayette, Louisiana, along with our children, at least those that had not headed off for college. We had planted a church in Lafayette. I was telling Tony it was delightful for us because we didn't have a building. We, were, we actually delightfully called ourselves a church without walls. And uh, we were looking for a place to worship, and the local Roman Catholic community was very gracious. They were also in Louisiana. It is a state church, so there's not really any questions about it. And the local Monsignor said, look, we've got this new high school we just built, and you're welcome to use it. It was St. Thomas More High School. And then if you know your Anglican Roman Catholic history, know that that was <laughs> particularly delightful, uh, that, that we were worshiping in St. Thomas More High School. We had grown from a handful of folks, and we now had more than 500 members in the five years that we'd served. It had been an amazing adventure, and we'd seen God work in powerful ways. But now I was confronted with a new challenge, because I'd just been invited to become the rector of All Angels Church on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Now, I love New York. I love the city. It, but it was an agony for me, because it would mean leaving all that we'd accomplished, all that was familiar, and starting anew in a, in a very different setting. And there were many questions. You know, where would you live? What, would it be safe? I mean, everyone had these nervous feelings about Manhattan. What about schools for the children? How would we connect with a bishop who was a liberal icon? When I first met him, he said, I love, no, I hate charismatics, and I love homosexuals. What do you think about that? That was his opening line to me, Paul Moore. And I said, well, Bishop Moore, I respect your views. I disagree with you. He said, well, we can get on if you don't fight me. I said, well, I won't fight. Uh, and we had a glorious ministry there. But it was tough, and I was scared. How would the new congregation respond to us? I mean, Upper West Siders, that some of you got from New York, they're different from the rest of the world, you know? <laughs> and what about our church in Lafayette? We just got this little baby going, five years old, and growing and moving. With all these questions buzzing through my head, I decided to spend some time at a, a nearby Jesuit spirituality center in the nearby town of Grand Coteau. It was a beautiful place for personal retreats, so I took my questions to the Lord in prayer. But it wasn't long before the Lord answered. The words of a renewal song, Here I Am, Lord, began to fill my mind. Dan Schutte, a Jesuit songwriter, had written it, and the words of the refrain are, Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. It just kept filling my brain. Just, I didn't even remember learning it, but it was just there. It was just the Lord speaking to me. And, of course, I had no question at all. Eh? It was, we had to go. And we began another amazing missionary adventure. And we learned yet again that mission is always the concluding step of authentic worship. We had encountered the presence of God in all of his holiness. We'd be confronted with our own unworthiness. We accepted God's forgiveness, and in grateful response, we offered our lives. Now, there's another key passage I want you to be aware of in the Bible that illustrates the foundations of biblical worship. And it can be found in the last chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And I wonder if any of you have got Bibles nearby? I'd like you to help me with it. Anyone got a Bible? Luke, you got a Bible? could you read, start it in verse 13 and just read until you get weary and then someone else can pick it up. Uh, Luke 24, verse 13 and following. Why don't you stand and do it so we can hear your voice. 24, 13. Now that same day too, then we're going to a village called Emmaus 
about seven miles from Jerusalem, they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as we walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem? Do you not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? He asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people, the chief priests and our rulers, handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. Okay, let's wait take a woman to follow that up. And no surprise in their voice that uh, they were there. Okay, would you follow, please? Wonderfully read. Thank you, both of you. Familiar story, and yet it's impossible for us to ever imagine the dark despair that those two disciples had felt. Their world, all of their hopes, their dreams had come to an end on that hill called Calvary. They had expected him to be the Christ, the Messiah, the one whom God would use to drive out the Romans and reestablish a mighty Jewish state, just like King David had done. But he had failed. He had been nailed to that tree and died under a divine curse. On that day, Cleopas and his companion's long-hoped dream, dream of liberation, had shattered before their eyes. The world had been forever changed. And yet, if that weren't bad enough, even in death, Jesus was not left alone. Although he was buried along with all their hopes and aspirations, someone broke into his grave and stole his body. It was all too much, and so they left Jerusalem for the nearby village of Emmaus. Passing the journey by trying to make some sense of it all. And in the midst of that conversation comes Jesus. Luke tells that these disciples were kept from recognizing him. Their spiritual blindness had led to a case of temporary physical blindness. And so Jesus proceeds to help them understand his death in the light of the scriptures. That great scandal that had robbed these disciples of their belief in Jesus, his brutal crucifixion, the stranger on the road proved was all foretold in scripture. The entire Old Testament witness that the promised Messiah must first suffer these things and then enter into his glory. And while Jesus spoke to his wayward disciples from Scripture, their hearts began to burn within them with renewed hope. Eager to continue the conversation, they invite this stranger to break his journey and stay with them. And with Jesus as the host at the meal, he performs a traditional Jewish blessing over the food 
the same actions that he'd used when performing the miracle of feeding the thousands and also the Last Supper. He took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them. And as he distributed the bread, the eyes of the wayward disciples were at last opened to perceive that the stranger was none other than Jesus. And now they realized what the scriptures had foretold was indeed true, that Jesus was not just the good rabbi from Nazareth, but the Lord, the risen Messiah, the one who had conquered sin and death and had opened the way to eternal life for his followers. His mission fully accomplished, Jesus simply left. As for the two disciples, their faith had been enlarged enough to grasp the utterly revolutionary truth of Jesus' divine lordship. And at once they reversed course. Although it was evening long past the ordinary time to travel, they retraced their steps, returned to Jerusalem, rejoined the community of Jesus' followers, and added their testimony that through Scripture and the breaking of bread, Jesus, the risen Lord, had been made known to them. See, from the very beginning, the worship of the early church combined teaching from the Scriptures with the breaking of bread, word and sacrament. The word taught them that Jesus was their Lord, and in sharing a blessed fellowship meal together, they expressed their trust in what he had promised to give them, not merely sustaining food in this life, but also the redemption from sin through the cross, so that they would have eternal life in the next. And through the combination of both of these activities, Jesus was manifested in their midst and in their hearts, empowering them to lead transformed lives dedicated to his service. A man called Thomas Cranmer, you may have heard of him, combined these biblical insights with his own profound understanding of the English Reformation to shape the way that we now worship. It's impossible to give sufficient credit to his creative genius, but if you'd like to know more of him, I encourage you to read anything written by my friend Kendall Harmon. He devoted a great deal of his life to the study of Cranmer and shaped much of my own understanding. And I'm indebted to him for what he describes as the six marks of biblical worship that should guide us today. Just six brief points I want to make out here. First, converting. The aim of Christian worship is for people to encounter the living God and to leave change a result. Cranmer considered this mission or purpose to be the hallmark of all authentic worship. And our worship should ultimately be judged on whether or not it fosters an ongoing and increasingly discernible difference in the hearts, minds, and way of life of its participants. See, we gather for corporate worship to encounter the living God, not to say hello to the local clergy. You've all been there, and I've been there, and I've cringed when the clergyman walks out and says, good morning, everyone, how are you? How was your week? I didn't come to meet him. I came to meet the living God. That's why, in our traditional way, we say, blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. We are gathering to remind ourselves we're in the presence of God. And our task as clergy, as worship leaders, is to get out of the way. And as far as we can do so, to ensure that those who gather in worship encounter the living God and are changed as a result. We cannot make this happen, but we can and must pray that it does. During our time in New York City, we had an evening congregation made up chiefly of homeless men and women. They lived broken and brutal lives, and I realized I had little understanding of their day-to-day existence. Before every evening service, I prayed and prayed that God would direct my own every word and thought. Somehow, I would encounter God's transforming love, and and they did. We saw miracles week after week, and that worship continues to this very day. I remember one time we were there, there was a, a woman showed up for worship, her name was Elizabeth, and she had just come from jail. She had uh, killed two men and was back on the streets. And she was dressed in a camouflage kind of gear and carried a large machete. And sat at the back of the church. This is what you do when you minister in the city. Some of you know this. Sat in the back of the city with a knife and was muttering all kinds of threats. So I did the first immediate thing was to send Angela at the back to sit with her. That's <laughs> to make sure that all would be peaceful the role of the clergy wife. (laughs) And so she prayed, and uh, the next week Elizabeth came back, and I knew her name, so I said, how are you, Elizabeth? And she swore at me, and then, you know, sat in the back. And then week after week, I noticed she became a little less angry. I noticed this was a pattern. People would start at the back row and then kind of move a little closer to the front. And this one particular week, she was sitting about halfway down, 
And we had this method of doing prayers. I would invite people who had prayers to simply say, who needs prayer? And people put their hands up. I said, what do you need prayer for? So I did this, and Elizabeth said, I need prayer. And all the men said, oh, yes. <laughs> and she said, I need prayer for God to soften my heart. It is so hard, and I don't like living this way. Do you realize how much guts I took for that woman to do that? And we prayed for her. And we implored that God would begin to work on our heart, and God did. She put the machete somewhere else. She stopped swearing, and she began to move closer to the front of the service. That's what it means to encounter the living God. She didn't come to see me. She, became, she came to be transformed by the power of God. So, worship is converting. Secondly, it must be spirit-filled. Only supernatural empowerment by the Holy Spirit can truly open the hearts and minds of people and stir their wills to begin to return to God and to their true selves. From its very beginning, under Cranmer, the Anglican liturgical tradition relied upon the power of the Holy Spirit to enliven its worship in order to promote personal and corporate renewal. Seen in this light, the enthusiastic congregational participation that is a hallmark of charismatic worship, I would submit, is authentically prayer book worship. Because it's meant to be enlivened by the Holy Spirit. And I think the whole idea of invoking the Holy Spirit, though I believe the Holy Spirit is already present, I'm not sure I need to always ask, but it reminds us on, on whom we must depend. In my own life and ministry, I found that I silently pray in tongues throughout the whole worship whenever I'm leading because I want to be attuned to what the Spirit of God might be prompting me to do and also giving me the courage when I step out and take risks. Because sometimes that comes with the territory. One time I remember one Sunday at, when I was rector of Truro Church, it happened to coincide with the feast of the presentation of Christ in the temple. Now I'm not asking for you to remember what date that is, but it's in February. But it's an amazing feast. And I preached on the importance of each one of us presenting ourselves for God's service and how important it was for parents to offer their children to the Lord. And just as I gave the offertory sentence, I had a very strong leading to announce that this morning when we were taking up the offering plates, I would like any parents present to bring up their children and in action offer their children to the Lord. Well, there was an audible gasp from the congregation. Uh, the ushers looked stunned. Uh, they weren't sure how to connect offering and children running around. <laughs> but then I noticed a number of parents were listening and they ran out to the nursery and they came back. And as we, we took up the financial offering, they were lifting up their children before the Lord and offering them to the Lord. People were weeping. Now, everyone said, let's do it next week. I said, no, no, no. <laughs> no. It was the Spirit of God prompting me and prompting you to, to make this wonderful action of lifting our children and placing them in the Lord's care. So, it needs to be spirit-filled. It also needs to be scriptural. According to Cranmer, the divinely appointed means for encountering the Holy Spirit is through his word. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. In hearing, singing, praying, seeing, and inwardly digesting the old, old story, we have listened too much to the devices and desires of our own hearts, and our own stories are often filled with way too much self-deception. We meet God when we hear his story, told in his own words, from his story, I love that, his story, history, hmm, we learn that we're not like him, that his ways are not our ways, and that because we're not like him, we are alienated not only from our true home in him, but our true selves as he made us. And only in such brokenness do we recognize our need for his spirit to tell us his saving truth, as well as to turn us around towards beginning to embody that truth. True Anglican worship, true biblical worship, must impart the saving doctrines of Scripture, and its prayers must be imbued with Scripture's own spiritually powerful saving words. You know, in recent years, I've been appalled by the growing number of churches, many describing themselves as evangelical, that have given up the public reading of Scripture. And while many of the sermons I hear in these places have the, the occasional biblical reference, they are more like motivational chats other than biblically-based proclamations. We dare not give up on the public reading of Scripture. There is power in the Word of God. It is an amazing gift. How dare we hide it away? Now, I'm not suggesting we should read it as a grim duty or just drone on. Scripture is exciting and life-transforming and needs to be presented as such. 
Some of the more familiar texts can also be presented in the form of dramatic narrative. Some can even be the basis for chancel dramas. There's so many wonderful ways in which we can lift scripture before the people of God. I found this especially true during those famous, you know, the wonderful passages of Holy Week and the Christmas narratives. They just cry out to be presented in dramatic form. And there's so many available resources to help you do just that. The important principle is we do not live by the latest liturgical fad or personal whim by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the word of God. Do I hear an amen? amen? By the way, you know what amen means? It doesn't mean, oh dear, he's almost finished. <laughs> it means, so be it, I agree. Amen? amen. Mm. One more time. Amen? amen? Thank you. Okay. I hate it when you go to church and go, oh, amen. No. Okay, scripture, sacramental. Cranmer understood that God involved the full range, listen to this all of you artists, the full range of human senses when communicating his message of salvation. As Jesus himself became human so that he could directly engage human perceptions as one of us, he also used creaturely things as vehicles for making the promises of his gospel known. He used human words to proclaim his saving message. He has instituted water for baptism as well as bread and wine and communion to make these words visible. He's also given humanity music and art as further means by which the Holy Spirit can engage our creaturely senses and deeply engrave the truths of Scripture directly on our hearts. Music for me is one of the most powerful things because it actually speaks to the heart. And it bothers me when we put music to one side, when there's battles between clergy and musicians. What a horrible thing that is. Because music, is a, it speaks to the language of love to the heart. And it's transforming. When music tells us the many stories of the human condition, it has the power to move our emotions. But when music becomes a bearer of gospel promises, it becomes an effective vehicle for feeding on Christ through which the Holy Spirit moves the soul. To be true, to our heritage, contemporary biblical worship should combine the best of all three creaturely means of encountering Christ, biblical preaching, sacraments, sacred music. And I would suggest to you, we also need to start thinking creatively about the ways in which art can be part of our worship. That's not a new thing, by the way. Ask Tony, he'll tell you. Yeah, I mean, the Roman Catholic Church did this years and years ago. Have all these wonderful pictures that people walked in there and just look at them, and they're transformed by that. We need to read you know, all those whitewashed walls. I know they were meant to remove idolatry, but what they did, they removed imagination instead. We just became idolatrous on other things. So we need to find ways to engage all these things in our worship. Now, I've been blessed to work with a number of superb church musicians. They also helped me understand the power of music to touch and transform lives. And in fact, I've always treated musicians as close colleagues, critical to the effectiveness of any service of worship. One of my most treasured moments took place while I was leading the first service for the homeless at All Angels Church in New York City. When I arrived, the church had an evening feeding program. And I thought it would be wonderful to combine this with some kind of evening worship. An opportunity presented itself when a Gloria, a homeless woman, asked if I would baptize her infant son. I agreed, but pointed out that baptism was not intended to be simply getting the kid done, but an essential component is becoming a member of a believing community. After a number of conversations, I announced that we would hold the service of baptism the following Sunday evening, and that afterwards, everyone would eat supper downstairs. I was hoping that this would set a new pattern for ministry. Well, the next Sunday arrived together uh, with a late afternoon thunderstorm, which made life even more challenging for those living on the streets. So they were less than happy when I insisted that they gather for worship before sitting down to eat. We started with a praise song, as you imagine, I didn't lead it too well, and the response was deadening. The last thing in the world they needed to do was indeed to praise the Lord. They were just miserable. They were cold. They were angry. And I began to regret ever imagining this would work. And then in desperation, I walked over to my musician who was over the side. I said, Ron, I'm dying. He said, I can see. (laughs) I said, well, can you play something else? How about Blessed Assurance? There's some kind of good old gospel standard. So Ron nodded, began to play an up-tempo version of that gospel standard. All the time, the congregation's watching me. You know, homeless people love to watch people. That's what they do most of their lives. And they were watching to me to see whether I would get angry and blame them, which is what most people did. And they could see I was struggling to reach them. 
Finally, I noticed a man get up from his seat, get a sitting kind of with Tony, he came up and he sat next to my musician, was up here. Now, that's not Anglican protocol, by the way. But he sat next to me on the, on the piano bench and he said, do you know his eyes on the sparrow? And Ron said, no, but if you sing it, I can play it. It appeared the man had been a professional musician before becoming homeless. So he started to sing in a clear tenor. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. The entire congregation began to weep. They all stood and they swayed and they began to sing. The Spirit of God fell on this entire congregation. 30 years later, that congregation is still worshipping there. And Gloria is in the choir. That's what God is about. That's what happens when we allow the Spirit of God to inform and direct our worship. When we stretch our imaginations. I've got one last one. I did two. I have two. I've got four minutes. Okay, quick. Um, it must be culturally appropriate. If God became flesh to become one with humanity, then his message must be conveyed to each generation in a form effective for contemporary culture. That's why Cranmer broke with centuries of tradition and insisted that the language for worship in the Church of England must be in a language that people understood. He also wisely recognized that patterns and practices of scriptural worship would vary not from only from one era to another, but also from one country to another. And in this 21st century, these principles have proved to be invaluable. Angela and I are part of this whole thing called the Anglican Communion. We've traveled the world and we've seen worship expressed in lots of different ways, but always at its heart is this biblical, transforming, converting, spiritual worship, and lives are changed. But there is some cultural adaptation. I love one thing in Nigeria. They love to dance. And when they bring up the offering, they dance up. And they, everyone comes up. Old men shuffle, tend to. Um, the women dance, they move around, and it's just incredible, exuberant joy. And that wouldn't fit in England where everyone is tired and tight. But it's a way in which we embody the local cultural. I lived in Louisiana, for example. They would never have a clock person telling me when to stop in Louisiana because it's, a, it's an oral culture. And they keep on going. They tell stories. And if people are listening, they keep on going. So we need to be able to be adapt. I'm adapting fast. OK. One final thing. It must be gospel driven. Gospel driven. All of our work, no matter how creative at its heart, is propelled and inspired by the gospel. Salvation by grace alone, justification by faith alone, lived out in the pursuit of holiness. For grace produces gratitude, gratitude births love, love leads to repentance, and repentance brings forth good works, and the good works continue to a better society. Therefore, at the heart of authentic worship is conveyed by word and sacrament, the power of God's unconditional love, so that all humanity might begin to love him and others afresh. And every time I've led a worship service, I always ask myself the question, was the gospel proclaimed? That's my question. Not did I blow it, not did I get the wrong pitch, not did I, whatever, I might have blown it, but was the gospel proclaimed with power and conviction? That's always my question to myself. And that's the question I, I urge you to ask yourselves. So, converting, spirit-filled, scriptural, sacramental, culturally appropriate, gospel-driven, God is glorified, the angels rejoice, Thomas Cranmer will be proud, and lives will be transformed. And let me conclude. I've got one. Just, I beg you, just for one, let me do one thing. I want to read to you a hymn. It's from the 1940 hymnal that, that uh, was given great praise last night. And I want you to close your eyes when I read it. Uh, I won't leave, but I want to read it to you. And it's, I want you to let your imagination, this is where all of you have got imaginations, I want you to let them kind of just fill out the words and the ideas as I read this, this hymn to you. Praise my soul, the King of heaven, to his feet thy tribute bring. Ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven, evermore his praises sing. Praise him, praise him, alleluia, praise the everlasting King. Praise him for his grace and favor to our fathers in distress. Praise him still the same as ever, slow to chide and swift to bless. Praise him, praise him, hallelujah, glorious in his faithfulness. Father-like, 
He tends and spares us. Well, our feeble frame he knows. In his hands he gently bears us, rescues us from all our foes. Praise him, praise him, alleluia. Widely yet his mercy flows. Angels, help us to adore him. Ye behold him face to face. Sun and moon bow down before him. Dwellers all in time and space. Praise him, praise him, alleluia. Praise with us the God of grace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Bless you all.